Hi, everybody. This is Jason Henderson, the host of the Castle of Horror podcast, and I have another retrospective encore episode to share with you. This is another one of my favorites, but it's a very early one. We recorded this episode all the way back in 2011 when we had much cruder recording equipment. So for that, for a little bit of fuzziness, I'll go ahead and apologize. But I wanted to repost it because a lot of people are at home and because uh, Sven Gulli this week is playing The Horror of Dracula. So without further ado, here is our discussion of The Horror of Dracula. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the Horror of Dracula episode of the Castle Dracula podcast, where we talk about horror movies, vampire movies, and all-around awesomeness, brought to you by alexvanhelsing.com. Today we're talking the one, the only, 1958 Dracula, starring Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing, and written by Jimmy Sangster, Jimmy Sangster who just passed away last week. Bear in mind that if you haven't seen today's movie, we're going to be talking about it from the perspective of horror movies who horror fans who have, so warning, spoilers ahead. I'm your host, Jason Henderson, author of Alex Van Helsing, Voice of the Undead, currently out from HarperCollins, so look for it on Amazon or your local store. Send me a note when you do. With me are Drew Edwards, the creator of the long-running horror parody comic Halloween Man, which you can find at HalloweenMan.com. Say hi, Drew. Hey, hey. Tony Savaggio, writer of comics like Psycom from Tokyo Pop and Clockworks from Hugh. At Jewelers Mutual, we're a little obsessed with jewelry. Obsessed like auctioneers with talking fast. 50, we're going to Pop stars with auto-tune. And dentists with asking questions so, how did he propose? after they've put their hands in your mouth. Great. Yes, we've made jewelry our obsession for over 100 years. We love it so much we named our kids Ruby, Amber, and Opal. Venti soy latte for Opal? At Jewelers Mutual, we insure jewelry and only jewelry, which is why people who are also obsessed with jewelry trust us with theirs. And also of the band Deserts of Mars, say hi, Tony. Howdy. And attorney Julia Guzman, say hello, Julia. Hello, Julia. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Finally. You keep doing you that. Let me, you got to let me do it. <laughs> you keep doing that. Obviously. We're going to find another token female. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I will spare people a blow-by-blow synopsis, but here's the gist of the movie. In 1880s Middle Europe-ish British world, Jonathan Harker travels from his hometown of Karstadt to visit the evil Count Dracula in his castle in Klausenburg. Harker pretends, to, pretends that he is there to catalog Dracula's books, but in fact he's on a mission to destroy the Count. He's sort of an anti-vampire spy. A mission that fails. And soon, Dracula ventures out to destroy the people that Harker loved, his fiancée Lucy, Lucy's brother Arthur, and Arthur's wife Mina. And set against the Count is Harker's vampire-hunting partner, Dr. Van Helsing, who must avenge Harker's death and destroy Dracula once and for all, which happens in an amazing action sequence at the end of the film in Dracula's castle. And I, there's almost no spoilers in there because, honestly, we're going to spoil it as we talk about it. But this movie is, is so well known that it just seemed absurd to, to try to, to do a, a full-on synopsis of it. Okay, I am so excited to be discussing Dracula from 1958. I want to get people's first impressions. You are totally welcome not to like this movie, but uh, this, is, this one's a classic, and, and I, I, I'm really excited at least to discuss it the the good, the bad, and the fantastic. Um, so starting with Tony, first impressions, Horror of Dracula, a.k.a. Dracula, what do you think? Oh, I really liked it. Actually, I would watch it over the Coppola one any day oh. of the week. Like, I just, it's just so hammer. I don't know. It's just so good. Like, it's got so many bits. I mean, it's it's weird because it, it's a lot like the book and so much different. It's It's so strange that they kind of combined everything in such a weird way like every time you think like oh it's gonna go back that way you're like whoa now it goes over here mm-hmm. and uh i don't know it's been it had been a little bit since i'd seen it so when i was watching it the other day um it was it was just cool the crazy like bombastic soundtrack where it's just like Duh, like every fanfare yeah. oh man it's just i mean it's over the top it's one of those where i'm watching it late night and i'm having to turn the sound up and down because the soundtrack just booms i that's that soundtrack goes awesome. It goes. I'm playing. I'm playing it. I'm playing it in the background. Can you not hear it? No. I've got it playing. I've got it playing on the computer. But like, I can only imagine in a theater how like just insane that would be. Yeah. And somebody, yeah, yeah, draft house or somewhere should do another hammer thing and show it again. But yeah, I, I. I thought it was awesome. I like all the bits. <laughs> all the bits. Uh, okay, Drew, first impressions, Dracula. Well, um, this is a movie 
that I'm just going to come right out and say it, and I, I say this as honest as I possibly can. When I was a little kid, and I was a, like a horror movie nerd pretty much from the get-go, but the, the very first vampire movies I saw were all the universal black-and-white vampire movies. And I don't remember how old I was, but... And I was a little kid, and I stumbled across this movie on some, some television late at night. And this movie scared the hell out of me. As a kid. Like, I move, move over Freddy Krueger, move over Michael Myers. Like, I thought Christopher Lee was the most terrifying human being on the face oh, yeah. of the planet. <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, this is a movie that stayed stayed with me, you know, more more or less, uh, and I revisit it every so often. And you know, it's been it, it's been probably about a, a year, year and a half since I last saw it. And you know, I tried to watch it this time, and you know, sort of if that's even possible, like blank out all the previous times I watched it. And, you know, obviously it's not as scary to me as an adult but it's still a pretty effective horror movie. And what surprises me about it when I was watching it, trying to watch it with somewhat of a naive perspective, you know, it's a lot more modern than even some of the hammers that come out of it, that come after it. Like even the one, you know, Legend of the Salt, Seven Golden Vampires, which feels very painfully 70s. Yeah. Like this, this, oh, movie, yeah. this movie seems way way more modern than that. I mean, there's still a lot of, you know, there's a slapsticky, you know, sort of bit characters that still feel very much of their time. But for the most part, this is like a bam, 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 bam. You know, it gets going, it grabs you by the throat, and it rips your throat out, pushes you down on the floor, and says, okay, this is where we're going with this. <laughs> so I think it's an awesome it's an awesome movie. That's out, that's outstanding. Um, Julia? First impressions, Dracula. Got Julia bringing us usually the the perspective of a non horror fan who's been forced to watch an awful lot of horror movies. <laughs> go that's go funny, ahead. Funny that you funny you should mention that because that's exactly the perspective I was going to come from. Um, I was thinking that uh, that watching this that it reminds me so much of because I grew I mean I watched musicals you know that was my thing I like watched my my Fair Lady and Oklahoma and The Music Man and I thought to myself this looks just like those movies except if a vampire was in or I should say as except that they don't break into song and half the time I expect them to break in to just kind of bust into song. Like you know, when like one of those outside, um, you know, I suddenly expected the I can't remember who it was, but uh, somebody walked out and I just expected him to go, oh, Oklahoma, you know, or or or, yes. um, or the uh, or Lucy is walking around. Lucy's walking around in her room with her her light, cotton nightgown, and she opens the window dramatically, and I expect her to turn around and go, I could have danced all night. You know, it's just like I just I expect that these these that's just what I have in my head from that time period for some reason is these fifties musicals. So you know, so I would funny. kill I would kill to see somebody create a wonderful wonderfully faked Technicolor Hammer musical, musical of the Hammer. <laughs> exactly, but that's, well, so that's well, no, it's it's. It's funny you say that because I always feel like, in a lot of respects, uh, musicals and horror films have the exact same bombastic quality. Yeah, uh -huh. I, I would go with that. Yeah, because I watch a ton. I didn't watch a ton of musicals when I was younger, but I watched sure, a lot sure, of musicals of with Rain. <laughs> and, I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, we had season passes the past few years for, like, every musical that came to Bass Concert Hall. Well, and, so. and she does and she does make them. To yeah, and she, yeah, and she writes credit. musicals. So, um <laughs> And I, I agree. I think it's the like the groovy set. So yes. yeah. like I yes. mean everything could I totally get that. Like well, and the production yeah. quality, the, produ yeah, yeah. The, the the production quality is the way. Yeah, exactly. Sweeney Todd. Uh, Darren mentioned Sweeney Todd. And oh like, yeah. That's exactly how it would be. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, it would be, it would be actually the funny thing is. The funnier such a musical would be, the more obscure it would be likely to be. That's the difficulty, is that, that to get to the really good laughs, you would have to really do a decent parody, and that seems unlikely at this point. You know, you know Christopher, Lee actually, hmm. Christopher Lee actually has attempted a singing career a couple of times. So. Oh, yes. Yes. Well, I mean, he has a fine voice, you know, and, and, and he was all into classical and opera-type stuff. Wasn't it? And, I think yeah. he's been on like ah uh, who was it? Was it Christopher Lee? I think Christopher Lee may have done like um Blind Guardian. I think he's on a Blind Guardian album. I, I, I also oh yeah 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 no album. yes well and we were just watching actually Christopher Lee on uh, SNL just before just before this we were watching the 1978 I think episode where Christopher Lee hosted Saturday Night Live. Oh, Christopher awesome. Lee and Meatloaf, who was at that time doing his Bad Out of the Hell stuff. It was sweet. I mean, that was really, really cool. 
Um, and also, of course, like 20 years after the movie we're watching, we're watching right now. You want something else to blow your mind? This movie, Christopher Lee, and I'll, I'll talk about my first impressions bundled in with. All right, in this movie, Christopher Lee is exactly the same age as Colin Farrell in the Fright Night remake that we just watched. Wow. Yeah. Which is how old? Which is 35. So we can know how old? Which is 35. 35. Yeah. Which is, okay. you know, obviously a lot younger than I am. You know, it's, uh, it's, I always assume, for some reason, like I, f- I keep forgetting that I've actually gotten older ever, so I always assume everyone is my age. So it's like, well, Colin Farrell's our age, and then he turns out to be younger, and I'm just like, what? Yes. <laughs> it's like, yeah. you've blown my mind. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, okay, first impressions for me, I, okay, Bruce Wright, who wrote this wonderful book called Nightwalkers, the Gothic Horror, uh, Gothic Horror Movies of the Modern Era, he had this wonderful observation that that uh, it's almost impossible to say anything original about Horror of Dracula, because everybody's already talked about it, and it's, uh, you know, it's just like trying to, trying to, just, to say something original about Venice. Having said that, um... I love this movie. I love to try to imagine watching it in 1958 and to try to get a feel for it, you know, as if if the only awareness I had of Dracula was Bela Lugosi in black and white. Uh, because, you know, at this time, 1950s, Bela Lugosi and Dracula, that's the only Dracula anybody's known. The only Dracula that has been making the rounds is, uh, you know, based on that same Broadway play that uh, the movie was based on. And every Dracula film so far that I can think of, unless there's some obscure thing that that hasn't crossed my mind, has been in black and white. And then all of a sudden, here comes a big, big release of a Dracula movie, and it starts out with this crazy red color, and then it splashes color, you know, blood all over the name Dracula. And I, I mean, I, I just keep thinking this would like blow my mind. Um, I love. Well, the, yeah, go ahead. That's not dissimilar to my my own experience that I was just talking about. Like what you're like. Yeah. It did as a little kid. It freaked me out because the idea of it was so foreign it, to what I thought a vampire movie was supposed to be. It's so point. active. I mean, it's so you know. It really. I mean, it, you know, it's not active compared to I don't know. You know, like a dot. You know, live. What is it? The new, the new Die Hard movie. You know, it's it's okay. it's not live, it's not live active. Free or die hard. Yeah, Live Free or Die Hard. It's not active in the sense of a new action film, but it is very very active compared with with your typical vampire film, certainly of the time. You know that Harker, unlike in the book where Harker is going to sell a house, Harker shows up and he's rooting Dracula out. I mean, he shows up just to bring trouble into Dracula's house. <laughs> <laughs> which turns out to be this hilariously bad idea because Dracula then essentially gets the, the the bright idea of like leaving. You've got Dracula here presented. My favorite way to present this character, which is an extremely slick, uh, arrogant nobleman who manipulates people and uh, abuses them sexually and makes uh, basically makes mincemeat of the of the men around him. And reduces the the women to you know sexual slaves, and it's he is just he is basically just danger on legs, and that it's a, it's an incredible incredible character. So I uh, uh, the music I like is wonderful. That. Go ahead. Yeah. I like that he doesn't he kind of doesn't start that way. It's kind of like like when I was watching it, I was looking at wow, you know the there's a, I'd forgotten how many tiny pieces that the Bram Stoker's Dracula yes. and Coppola's like borrowed from this. Really, know? really. And I, and like you know, he starts out as not so imposing at the beginning, and then also, I mean, he signs his name Dracula. He doesn't call himself Count Dracula, right? When when he first comes in, and then that the scene where he just decides, like, yeah, here I am. Like he he just blows down the stairs and he gets right in the camera. And you're like, <laughs> oh man, holy cow! Like this guy is really he means it now. And he comes on and like a superstar. I mean, with yeah. that, that first, you you see him at the top. And he just sort of flows down the stairs, and and everybody, uh, you know, if you want to get really geeky, you know, they fully end all sound here. So any footstep is is an artificially inserted footstep. Dracula has no footsteps in this movie. So whenever he's walking around, there's no sound. Whereas when Harker walks around, there's footsteps. Dracula just flows down the steps and comes right into the camera, and then he's he's just this ultra awesome rich dude. He's like, hello, welcome to my house, blah blah blah, blah. you know, and he continues that way for like. A couple of a 
couple of scenes where he's just sort of large and in charge. He's like, I'm going to be going away. I'll be back tomorrow night. I hope everything goes fine. You know, and you know, and you're like, wow, Dracula's totally awesome. And then Here, here's the here's the key to my library because you'll need it. But unfortunately, you'll be locked in your room, so you're not going to actually be able to get to the library. <laughs> Right. No, absolutely. Absolutely. So, I mean, you're totally, I mean, well, no fool is going to watch Dracula and doesn't know this guy's going to turn out to be a vampire. So I suppose, you know, there is that. But you're totally disarmed so that later on, when he appears again, you're like, holy crap, what happened to the charming host? Yeah. But, yeah. Well, there's a, there's a line in you know, the, the movie we did last week, the new Fright Night, that I almost feel is a better description of Christopher Lee in here, where they compare him to the shark in Jaws. Yes, yes. And, you know, he's he's all teeth and appetite, and he, he just gets down to business. And yes. Yeah, you know, I, I was I was thinking about uh, his his appearance. We're, you know, we're skipping right to Christopher Lee. We may come back to it again, because I want to get back and talk about Hammer for a sec. But I, I was thinking of the scene where he comes into Mina's room and suddenly, you know, he's physically there. And I thought, you know, if you imagine this in real life, the this stranger, this sort of hypnotic stranger, has physically come into your house, you know, has physically entered the house and is just sort of walking towards you. What a strange and imposing image this guy is. And, and you can only imagine that he must be very hypnotic because no matter how good looking this guy is, if somebody actually physically comes in your house and starts walking towards you, most people are going to kind of freak out. Um, that, so yeah. I, uh, well, but it, she, I mean, she's under that weird spell because I actually thought the reaction that the women had was really interesting and complex because they don't, they don't, res- they want him there. I mean, they're opening the wind, the door oh, and, yeah. the, and, the, and the curtains and they have, and they're pulling down their, their thing. But then whenever they see him, they look, they're terrified. So I thought that was really interesting that, they are so conflicted. I guess that's a real metaphor for how a lot of women are with dangerous men. It's like, I, I want you, and yet I'm afraid of you. you know? yes. <laughs> I thought the, that was a really um, neat reaction. This is, yeah. I think, maybe the first vampire movie that I can think of where they, they compare the to a drug addiction. And I think, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of the, 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 face, the facial acting you're seeing in the, the female victims here yeah. is, is possibly based off of that. Both of those you know, are pretty a, new. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the the drug addiction thing. You're exactly right, Drew. That when when Van Helsing says that the people who are the people are both repulsed and attracted, very much like an addiction to drugs. Nobody had ever observed that before about vampires, at least in a movie. That was totally new. Um, well, no. Wait. Having said that, uh, they didn't talk about drugs, but that's kind of similar to what uh, to what Dracula's daughter was going through, you know, because she talked about compulsion. Yeah. But he talks about drugs, and that's a that's a new thing, you know, th- this notion that that it's it's like it's like being drug addicted. But you know, in other movies like Kiss of the Vampire, it will be explicitly related to uh, plagues born of sexual licentiousness. It'll be related to sexually transmitted disease. And note that it is not, they never discuss it here as an STD. Whereas in Kiss of the Vampire, it'll be explicitly discussed as being like an STD. Um, you know, how people go off to London and they come back vampires. And, well, uh, also I like how, how cunning, like, his victims get in like, oh, I'm so, I can't deal with this garlic. And like, oh, I'm so hot. <laughs> like, they'll do, and they'll do all the things that, you know, and yeah. you know, taking the cue from what Drew was saying again, like addicted people tend to do things also where they're like, "But I gotta go across town because that's right. the only place that has blah," and that yeah. that just happens to be also the place where I can buy drugs or do whatever. Yeah, and and so in that case, I mean, they they get really really cunning. In I mean, of course, the maid's really easily fooled. But, yes, but in just the way that they're like come up with all these ways to let Dracula in, you know. The sexual, the, like, the sexual, uh, dis, um, I don't even know what, the, the sexual misbehavior here is played to the hilt as deeply full of guilt and full of deviousness and, you know, and, and that was all deliberate, that, that yes, they're addicted to this guy at a, at an erotic level so that, so that these are like, they're stepping out, you know, and, and Lucy is, is, uh, is suddenly stepping out with this this guy just after her fiance died, and Mina. Um, by the way, all the names are flipped around, and it doesn't make any sense at all related to the book, and, and who cares? Mina is completely carrying on as though she's having an affair, and by the way, 
Michael Gao is such a milk toast that it it does play particularly painfully. You know that that the way that the, you know she's found this exciting, slightly frightening lover, and she's got Michael Gao as essentially a wax dummy well, portraying and, and the part of her a, husband. He's so awful in this movie. He's such an awful actor. And it really, I kept suspending my disbelief throughout the movie, <laughs> thinking, this is like really, a, and then all of a sudden he would do something and I'd be like, oh, that's right, they're actors. Because, I mean, just the fact, the way he responds to any of the losses, I mean, to the loss of, of Lucy, to the loss of uh, Mina, it's like he's just kind of like, oh, okay, well, what are we doing now? And then he'll kind of like do a, a physical kind of throw his body in a direction, like I'm being dramatic. But then he never had any emotional response to anything. He never, I mean, I just thought he was really distracted from the rest of the just awesome so cast. Homewood is the Jonathan Harker character, basically, in yeah. this movie. And, you know, he plays it like Jonathan Harker in any of the film versions of Dracula is never a terribly yeah. interesting character. He's more interesting in this movie, but, you know, the, the actual Jonathan Harker character. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But uh, that's because they, they made him, this, as, as Jason points out, this sort of anti-vampire assassin, as it were. Well, yeah, because you start to think the same thing about him when you first see him, where he's kind of responding in a very strange way. Like this woman comes up and says, I'm a prisoner, and he kind of is like, oh, okay. And then, you know, he gets locked in his room, and he's like, oh, okay. And then it turns out, oh wait, he this is all none of this is new to him. You know, he yeah, like totally he's, knows that what's going on. So that's the only reason. But that, uh, but until that point, I was kind of like, what is going on? I with really this guy? enjoyed. He's got no reaction. I enjoyed watching this with Julia, who had not seen this movie before, because she's like, God, what kind of an idiot is Harker? That when you know he gets locked in the room and he's like, oh, wow, well, and he's sort of underreacting to this stuff. And then of course he starts to write in his journal, and he's like. Yes, they've locked me in. I'm I'm good to go. Although I gotta say, uh, whatever, what you know, a sa- anti-vampire assassin, and I guess he drew the short, you know, straw with his partner Van Helsing that they were going to go after Dracula here. He does not seem to be prepared to find other vampires in this house. Um, well, no. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I, do so I don't know. Here. If they're at the beginning of this stuff, they don't really have much information on what's going on. I don't know. Um, I'd love to know what they're up to. I'd love to know, because it is never discussed in this movie. It's just completely glossed over. It is never discussed why Harker went on this mission, why Van Helsing didn't go with him, What? why they're doing this stuff together, what brought them to it, what Van Helsing's background is. Nothing. You get none of that. <laughs> There's... You know, there's you do that. get hints of it though, because uh, Lucy says like, "Oh, well, Jonathan used to talk about you," and you know, he's like, "Oh, good things," and she's like, "Oh, wonderful things," or something That's right. to the effect of that. That's absolutely right. I did. I forgot about that line. Yes, although we still don't have anything on, you know, what I also should point out, and this is going to segue into our into the concept of Hammer and the Hammerscape and Hammer movies. Okay, all right, these guys are in a weird world that is not the one it was made in and it's not the one that we live in and it's it's perfectly timeless as uh as Drew said because it's not the 60s it's not it's 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 kind of no time it's and and they are in a place called Karlstadt which has german names and occasionally peter cushing like clicks his heels together like he's like he's uh, a, a german soldier and you know, and they're wearing these awesome furs. And stuff like that. in the forties. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, or or proceeding, but at the same time, you've got these all. You know, and that's all the middle class. Okay, the middle class, the professionals, all of our heroes are all these basically Victorian British people with slightly Germanic stuff going on. They've just simply moved their British households into what appears to be a German village. And then you've got a bunch of Cockney guys doing all the lower class stuff, like being maids and running various businesses. Those are all pure, straight up Cockney. They're for laughs, and that's okay. You got one noble, and he's bad news. And that's I. I and it all takes place in this world that uh, is is just kind of no place. And it's it's wonderful. And you're going to see more and more and more of it with every one of these hammers. Uh, it's like my favorite piece of this universe is that that hammerscape. Anyone? Do you want to do you want to follow up on the on? on oh no, I I yeah, I love set design and it's just so weird. Like his <laughs> castle's so weird, and he's and it's actually the least when he drives up. It's the least imposing Dracula's castle that yes. I can remember. It's just kind of there. It doesn't have. It's not on a cliff that you can see. You know. Do you even see the castle? Uh, do, I, I'm trying to remember. Yeah, it. you do. Yeah, yeah. It's you just, do. It's so. 
not you're like okay well that's a castle but well, it's, it's very much like Dracula's castle like it usually is you know this is not a this castle is why I was castle. saying that it reminded me of like Oklahoma because it was just so like oh and now we're out in the you know on the big studio stage that's supposed to look like we're outside and there's oh look how pretty that they just spent a long time on that on the painting in the backdrop you know I'm <laughs> sure Go ahead. I'm sure the interiors were probably Hammer did have a habit if I remember correctly of using actual British mansion mansions well, and British. Castle. This is where this is where I get to this is where I get to go on my little temper tantrum because here's the thing I think what happened with the sets I think that they had a budget and I think that they told the people who were in charge of the furniture and the props the same number that they told the set designers except that it was all one budget for everybody and the props and furniture people spent all the money because all the furniture is gorgeous I mean I was coveting every single thing in this movie I was at a apothecary desk thing that he has in the bedroom, the awesome like antique uh, Roman revival chairs awesome. downstairs. Every single piece of furniture was just exquisite. But the to me the interior of this book because it's one it's the the castle is is a set it's like a studio set. It looks to me like you could blow the columns down, like they're made of pla- of cardboard that somebody painted white. Same thing with the coffin that Dracula's running around with. And I was just like, why when they have all this money that they've spent on this other stuff, and then and they do do some interiors. I think we Jason looked into it, and there was some interior that was done at Oakley Court. In yeah, I can give you I can give you the answers on this, but but, but yeah, but but the main uh, Dracula's Castle sets to me looked so cheap, and it was so sad because I was just I, I was so impressed with with the, a lot of the other part, aspects of the of the of the scene. Okay, here's you what know, I think. It's funny you mentioned. Yeah. The coffin, but when I when I saw his coffin at towards the end of the movie, I was like, "There's no way a big big guy like Christopher Lee mm-hmm. could fit in that mm-hmm. thing." I don't know what it's tiny, the and it looks like it's made the... of white cardboard. I told yes. Jason it looks like a wedding coffin because it's just yes. like this white dainty thing, you know. The dainty little cream colored coffin that he has is absurd. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, but but however. The carriage that carries that coffin away is awesome. That was pretty. Yeah, awesome. and it had no driver. Did you know it had no awesome. driver. Yeah, yeah, it was cool. Yeah, I think I was like, oh, man, that's were... crazy. Yeah, but... it's a hearse and it's got a big glass side, and it had like if I recall, like weird shapes on the on the sides. Okay, now, quick thing on the sets. So most of this was built. The the enormous outside thing with the, the bridge that he crosses and all that stuff. All that outside is a is the back lot at Bray Studios, which is a a studio built from you know one old house across from Oakley Court, which is now a travel hotel that you can actually go and stay at. And, I and dragged, we went and visited it. I That's did. Fun. I dragged my beautiful wife Julia to <laughs> Oakley Court and dragged her all around and pointed, hey, this is where the girls are doing calisthenics and lust for a vampire and all that stuff. <laughs> and uh, awesome, yeah. But so uh, some of the interiors were shot inside Oakley Court, which is a mansion, and the you know, like the stuff at the Homewood House. Most of the stuff was shot in sets built inside of Bray Studios. And in many cases, it's really two sets. It's Harker's bedroom, and then the rest is the Great Hall set shot from a lot of different angles. You got a, you got uh, an upstairs, like banister and, and hallway. You have a big staircase, and you have a lot of space. And then you have a lot of, like, wall things that they can move around. And, and so they're, they're dressing and redressing it like a Broadway show. Um, and here's here's what I realized. When I watched this movie years ago on TV, it was always a lot darker. Now, it could be that was because the film was degraded. But when you look at, like, film that people have taken of, you know, of watching this on TV or whatever, there's a lot more shadow in the blacks and the purples and everything are a lot darker, and I think it actually looks better in a in a in a darker film. So it's possible. I'm not saying definitely, but it's possible that we're seeing it brighter than it need than it should be seen. I, I don't know. Uh, I just don't think it should have been white. I mean, everything is white. The walls are white. The floor is white. The columns are white. The the archways are white. I mean, it seems like if they would have painted it all, you know, brown and kind of done a faux wood. But there's thing a lot or, of room. There's a lot of really wonderful color in here. There's always all of those wild, you know, like in in Harker's. There's all those grays, all those purples, all those um, blues. That's not the part, yeah. But uh, but I, I hear what you're saying is that a lot of it gets washed out. So I think the problem is that it's just way too overlit, you know. So mm-hmm. it's possible if we had like turned down the light on our TV because our TVs are nowadays bright as the sun. It's possible that if we had turned down the light, it would have uh, made a difference. I'm just guessing. Um, but, but I should say about the art direction, the design and all that stuff, I think it looks great here, and, and it looks like a Hammer movie. 
and it only gets better and better from here. I mean, like, uh, you're going to see a lot of these same sets in Brides of Dracula. What's the guy? Uh, who's the who's the set designer? Um, Bernard Robinson is the guy who just sort of created whole hog the look of this imaginary planet that the that the Hammer movies take place on because they all look like this. So Julia, if you don't like this, they all look like this. <laughs> well, like I said, the furniture is just gorgeous. Um, would you want to talk about the costumes too, since we're in the the visual? Yeah, go crazy. Yeah. Thing. I mean, I I would love. I don't. I would like to know why. And well, okay. First of all, you said, "What is it like to be watching this movie in 1958?" I want to know what people are thinking about the clothes in 1958 because I'm looking at those clothes and going, "I wish that men dress like that now." I mean, this guy's wearing like burgundy velvet three-piece suit, or, or I guess the jacket and the vest were burgundy velvet. I don't remember what the pants were. You know, then this is uh, Ben Helsing, who is kind of a serious guy or whatever. And then yeah. you know, he's got the coat, the green coat with the fur collar. I'm just like, how come I only gay people are allowed to that dress coat. that way now? <laughs> what? You know what? Screw that. Yeah. I want that coat. He looks like a pimp. Like, yeah. I, it's fabulous. I want it's a fat, you're right. Pimps, pimps and gay guys are the only ones who are allowed to wear clothes like that. And no, I think that's wrong. Peter Cushing can carry <laughs> off any darn thing that he wants. He he, he just – that coat – Actually, uh, I, I want everybody to just weigh in on because we should we should actually get right to the best part of this, which is the cast. Because Cushing, starting with Cushing, he is just badass. I mean, the, and and I, and everything he wears, everything about him, uh, I I'm just amazed at him here. Yeah, Drew, I know you're a big Cushing fan. You were gonna you were gonna throw something out here. Man, Peter Peter Cushing in this movie for. Like, this and Brides of Dracula, I don't think there is a cooler on-screen vampire killer. And I will yeah. stack that up against your, your Wesley Snipes and your Sarah Michelle Gillers and your uh, George Clooney's and pretty much everybody. Like, he is so cool. And, you know, he's simultaneously, and you, you've often remarked on this, that he's simultaneously, you know, this man's man sort of action hero type. He's also very cerebral, but at the same time, he's also very spiritual, which yeah. the director of this movie, who directed, you know, a lot of the Hammers, Terrence Fisher, like that was sort of his idealized man. You know, this is what he thought a man should right, be. Right. And uh, I love that about uh, this character. He's sort of a Judeo-Christian Batman. And yeah. He's great to watch. You know, he when he, he you know he comes down. You know, when they discover Dracula's in Homewood's house, he goes down and he tosses that cross in there. And then, of course, in the the confrontation, he he's running across. Yeah. And, you know, yanking that thing down. And he's got the you know the candles, the famous thing where he puts two candlesticks together. I mean, just everything about Peter Cushing in this movie just reeks of cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They meant to that. He he bails Arthur out more than once, which you really oh. even you're like he does what and bails. Arthur, yes, uh-huh. out like he's just like, man, does he have to do everything? Like, yes. really. And, and the thing is, he's fully <laughs> equipped, he's fully capable of doing everything. Kind of yeah. like Arthur's like, why don't you go? Why don't you lock yourself in a room away from the library? Yes. Let me do what I need to do. I also like how brutal, like. I mean, killing the vampires is brutal in this movie. We we cut away a lot, but you know it's a serious deal. I mean, everybody. Well, the, the can, I, can I just say? Horrible. Can I just yeah. say about that? What the hell was Harker thinking? Going for the girl first and not killing Dracula first. <laughs> I mean, don't you think Dracula's the obvious one to kill first? You know, and then he goes over. He kills. He kills the girl. And then he turns around and Dracula's gone and he grabs Dracula's now at the top of the stairs, which I'm like, why did he go upstairs just to come back down and, and turn him into a vampire? And we decided that the only purpose that there could be for him to go upstairs is so that he could make the dramatic entrance back down. Oh man, again. that entrance is awesome. That's true. He's like the way he like comes in, he's like, Yeah, now's the time when he shuts the door, you're like, Oh, this is hot. That is so imposing and just like mm-hmm. Dracula I like how also <laughs> like it's a little off topic, but when when stuff goes down and Dracula has to like discipline the woman and Harker, you know, yeah. like it's like it's like is Dracula gonna have to choke a Harker? You know, it's like, <laughs> it's like he's got some great he's got all some of the great wrestling moves. You're just like holy crap! Like what? You just came into this scene, you wouldn't even know what was going on. You're like, wow, what? what the hell? And he's choking people and he's throwing people around and oh man, that was just that was awesome. You know, you mentioned yeah, the shutting of the door. Strong in this movie. Oh yeah, no, it, it, that reminds me of the what is it the the Vader the, the Vader monologues or or what? The, oh, yeah. the, and, and there's a lot of there. 
you know, a lot of that those lines can be put to to him here, especially when they shut, you know, oh yeah, when they shut the door. There's actually a moment, you know, there where he shuts the door and he's gonna he's gonna absolutely tear Harker apart. There's the scene instantly where they do a north another door shut, and Terrence Fisher actually plays with our Hollywood. Uh, sensibilities where you know he goes into I think it's Mina's bedroom and then the door shuts demurely and then we're inside and we're fo- we continue following him and it's it's really cool it's like we're not going to cut away we're going to go see Dracula make out with with uh, with Mina before before he bites her um, but also also with Van Helsing like he a he's, he's doing the wax cylinder thing which comes up in you know different yes and, and that was really cool like oh you know they're harkening yeah. back to this and then his just his resolve, like when he's you know, has to get rid of Lucy, and yes. then you know, although at that it could totally be the cutaway from uh, Dracula's daughter, like where he comes out at the beginning. Like yes. you could totally right. go from you know back in time and go from from this movie to that one, and it would make sense, right? Like where he kind of stumbles out. Mm-hmm. Um, oh no, absolutely, and uh, it, it's was, it is that was cool. It's amazing to watch him here and to think about the, how the the word uh, Drew that that I had seen used. And I'm not, you know, I wasn't the first to use it. There is that concept running around at the time, and I guess now, called muscular Christianity. This guy who's going to use the powers of God for all kinds of, of heroic daring do, and, and also to be a, a heroic, um, you know, exhibitor of of his faith. And this guy seems to know everything because, again, if this is Harker's partner, Harker didn't seem to know very much at all, and Cushing really seems to have it down. He either knows I it think, by study or he knows it instinctively. Go ahead. I think if Van Helsing had been the one to go in, I think he would have taken care of business. I think he wouldn't have had a movie. Like, right. He, he would have just annihilated the, the vampire girlfriend and then, you know, probably taken care of Dracula in short work. Yeah, you get this like impression that, that he's just, that he's got this whole man. You got if you want something done right, you got to do it yourself. Kind of attitude going yeah. into this thing. Yeah. Well, and he's completely. Um, he's so serious. He reminds me a lot of I don't know Batman in the comics or, or a few other characters where his concerns are so beyond whatever pissant little sarcastic thing you have to say or you over there or you crying random person. None of this matters. Everybody just listen to me as I tell you what to do. And, and he's. He's not even. He doesn't even get upset with people. And he reminded me at this one point when he's putting on a jacket, like he's kind of walking around putting on a jacket. He reminded me of Mr. Rogers. I started expecting him to sing, start singing. That's true. You know, it's so beautiful because he's talking about like, you know, I think he's talking to um to um oh, what's his name, the brother. Um, oh, Arthur. Arthur Ar- yeah. once again. He's talking to Arthur and he's just kind of like blah 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 about vampires as he's putting on his jacket. And Jason and I yes. are going, where is he going? Why is <laughs> he? <laughs> He, suddenly, for no reason, yeah, he's he has gotta look, really, he's gotta look good. Yeah, he, he, he has some complicated blocking where he lights. He's talking, and he and and Peter Cushing is so good with business, you know, any sort of physical business. So in this case, he lights a little cigarillo, and then he, you know, he puts on a double-breasted jacket, and he he puts on a double-breasted jacket better than anybody I've ever seen. You know, something else interesting here. Peter Cushing said that. Um, learning from Lawrence Olivier, he learns that if he can, if you can spring. Uh, across a room just like randomly in any given scene if you can like hop and constantly be sort of bursting from one place to the next it gives you a sense of action and he actually employed that where he never kind of just walks he always sort of sort of you know bursts and springs and i believe that this guy he's really a bundle of energy um he's he's very scary (laughs) He's great. I have to. I have to say, um, the other thing that's interesting to me about Peter Cushing version of Van Helsing, especially compared to what you know American action heroes of the time, you know, again makes him seem a lot more modern. Yeah, is that yeah. he's also very sensitive. You know, he he, you know, so that that scene with the little girl, he's he's very kind to her, yeah. and you wouldn't see that in like a John Wayne action hero or something like that. I think you're like right. I, I I think you're right about that. I, I'm I'm trying to imagine John Wayne saying, you know, well, you stay here, and well, I don't know. I mean, maybe. Maybe it's hard to envision the scene, but you're right. He he does a lot of caring, a lot of patting on the back, and a lot of taking care of of you know uh, people when when he doesn't need to get down to business. And in that yeah. case, I guess he's saying, "Here, little girl, 
stay cool, wear my coat, be out here in the graveyard, and, and hang tight, and we'll be back in a minute. And by the way, uh, why is that little girl just wandering around by herself in the middle of the night? That's what I was wondering. She's like out at the park, and then she's in oh, the Oh, well, no, she was called out by Lucy. Lucy Yeah, but Lucy I just mean, like, out. she's just wandering. I mean, the earlier she was just wandering, too. Oh, my but, word. Um, well, Gerda is her mom, and Gerda apparently has better things to do. It's, it's very yeah. busy, very busy. Um, what do you Gerda's think about... watching Transylvanian soaps. Yes. <laughs> what do you think about Van Helsing's um, the Sherlock Holmes coat? Do you guys think that coat was just was that coat just worn and that in the eighteen whatever this is supposed to be nineteen hundred or eighteen eighty five? Supposed to be eighteen eighty five ish. Yeah, is that just something that people actually wore, or is it just because of the Sherlock Holmes or who? Like, where did it come from first? Because that coat shows up in this movie and it shows up in Sherlock Holmes. It shows up a couple other spots, but I've never seen it in real life. Like, you know. Stuff. I mean, I've never seen actual people that had that ever had it in any kind of old pictures or anything like that. I don't know anything about the Cape Coat except for, uh, uh, you know, in the Civil War. I mean, with, you know, our the American the American soldiers wore a coat like that. Um, but I I don't know. I, it's a good question. It's a really great question. And it also reminds it's, me it's, that Peter, go ahead. No? You're probably about to say the same thing. No, go crazy. You 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 do it. Go ahead. Peter Peter Cushing played Sherlock Holmes. Yes, and it was just like the the year later, right? In mm-hmm. Hound of yeah. the Basketball. Also, by Terrence, also filmed by Terrence Fisher. That's Do you right. think that's his coat, maybe? And he just likes wearing it in all the movies? <laughs> it could be. He goes through a lot of coats, Probably coat, it's the same coat. Yeah, I have yeah. no doubt it's the same coat. I absolutely have no doubt because they reuse everything. I mean, I was spotting this this uh, in this movie, I was spotting, like, sets that were going to be reused within, like, you know, 10 or 12 years later, the um, there's a place here that's like all covered up in fake moss and fake weeds, and it's like part of the graveyard set that in other movies is basically the entrance to the pub. I mean, after a while, you start recognizing like all of these pieces that they're just rolling around and, and making into, into new sets again. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so that's Christopher Lee. I mean, I'm sorry, that's Peter Cushing, but we should discuss Christopher Lee. Uh, who, uh, I mean, I know that we, we, we have to some extent, but, um, we talked about, we talked about how, what a predator he is. I should also mention this guy is extraordinarily tall. He is so different from Bela Lugosi. I mean, that's the thing that I keep wanting to come back to is, you know, if I, if I knew Bela Lugosi, I now look up and I see this guy with this amazing English accent and, when he's going up those stairs, you get a look at how freaking long his legs are, and it's just, uh, it's astonishing. I mean, he is, he is wraith-like. Uh, anybody else want to wanna touch on anything with, with Christopher Lee? Well, I, I think, well, I mean, the thing is, he's, like, I love how in this movie he's back to being, like, the ultimate corrupter. Yes. Ultimate seducer and also just not a good guy but he also he does the thing where i mean he's going like like when he sets his mind to it he's getting it yes whether he's flowing down the stairs and right into the camera or you know taking care of business with his minions or seducing someone or you know you know he's going to take out someone it's all like very he's he's used to getting what he wants and he's always going to get that and uh he's he's not you know he's just he's a predator he's an absolute predator and it's, it's, it's pretty cool to that again you know he's fantastic he definitely sets the bar for everyone else yes yeah it is it is hard you know when you see and by the way it sets the bar for him too because he doesn't ever get to play dracula as well as he did here that this this you know i honestly believe and other people might disagree with me that he doesn't get anything good to do in in uh, dracula prince of darkness not crazy about a lot of the stuff he does and any of the others except, you know, bits and pieces of movies here and there. I think he gets a lot of good business in Scars of Dracula, which a lot of people don't like. So this is honestly as good as it gets. He is absolutely a seducer, but what's really interesting about the seduction here, you know, in some movies he's a seducer and he's deeply in love. Here he is a seducer and he's out to harm. I mean, he's, yeah, he's not. He's, lo- that's what I love. Is he's not this love sick. Like, oh, I miss my former wife. He's like anybody who's not me is below, <laughs> right. like beneath contempt. He's like, he's he's really not out. Me, and you're not out to hurt. To whatever. Yeah. So you're either his sex slave or your dinner. Yeah. Right. Right. And that's and that's uh you know when you think of the the, the nearest I could explain the what I think he's getting across here is something almost like a child molester or 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 or. Uh, who is able to coerce and use all kinds of tricks and all kinds of things to get their victim, and then they destroy. He is really, 
really a predator. And that's not the case with like Frank Langella. I mean, I agree that Drew, with Drew, who was saying earlier, we should do Frank Langella uh, and, you know, to set it off. That guy is more romantic, although he still has the arrogance thing. This guy is is truly a you know a shark. That was that was a fantastic way of putting it. He's the only Dracula that is actually scary to me. I mean, Bela Lugosi's creepy. There's this you know like there's there's a lot of different Draculas, and they all have their good. Well, yeah. some of them have their good points and their bad points. But he really, first of all, like when I imagine the Dracula in the novel, he doesn't necessarily fit the physical des- description. No. But his behavior feels right to the Stoker Dracula. And, you know, just visually, like, even if you would just take away the fact that this guy is, is Dracula and a vampire and everything, like, if you were to see this guy anywhere, right. he seems like bad news. Like, you would not want to get in a fight with, with oh, this no. guy. Like, he would tear you apart. And he's scary. I mean, <laughs> there's yeah. very few times I can tell you, like, that I, I was ever moved to fear by a vampire movie. And this, this, this was really one of them. You know, Although, he, he hit the mark. What you did remind me, like the one that scared me as a kid, the one that stuck with me the most was there was a BBC uh, Dracula. Louis Jordan? And, and, uh, a BBC Dracula. Yeah, but it was, was it with, yeah. with, with who? Yeah. Louis Jordan or Denim Elliott? Which one? Um, I'm trying to think. I saw it last night, like on Amazon. No way. So I was trying to look it up, and it appears to be only on... Uh, or is it a recent one? No, no, no. It was like 78. Oh, okay. 77. No, it's 77, and then I would have probably seen it in 78. I was really, really, really young. So I think you're talking about Louis Jordan, but please continue. Go ahead. And that, especially, um, I want to say it was Mina, just scared me. I went hot, hid. I mean, it was terrifying. I would love to. I doubt it holds up. Maybe it's best if I just remember it being terrifying. Oh, well, listen, the but, uh, Mina, the bloofer lady in... Uh, in you know whether they they always swap the names back and forth, but the 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 vampire girl in Langella is scary as hell. I mean, she, oh, she is, looks like a zombie. Oh, she was terrifying, just just a terrifying character, and and that one, I, yeah, absolutely, I had nightmares about her. Um, yeah, there was, there was the you were right, Jason, and it was let's see. Remember, she had those giant red. Uh, she, her eyes glowed, and she also had these huge, like bruisey kind of circles around her eyes. Uh, that was an amazing character. Um, by the way, I think we should totally watch. Uh, what, what's the one, Count Yorga? Uh, I, <laughs> I mean, I've seen Count Yorga since the '70s, and and I think it would be really cool to to sort of see where where vampires were going at the time. Because in that one, what I recall is that the vampires there. Count Yorga was was really smart, but the rest of his vampires were almost like very fast moving zombies. I mean, they just, you know they didn't speak and they just sort of like boom, you know, and they would chase after you. It was cool. Um, you know, it's funny you mentioned Count Yorga and all the the movies that sort of were based off of this. The thing that I enjoyed going back and revisiting this movie was you know after seeing all the Fright Night was that we were basically watching what the Fright Night movies are making fun of. That's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. And I wonder if in the Fright Night films, you know, clearly Tom Holland, the director, knew what he was doing. But would the audience, you know, in 1985, you know, with with those movies? So, I mean, I guess maybe they're showing up on TV, but generally well, it's I an saw, intro, that's all really. I saw the Hammer movies yeah. right. on TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, me too. Before we close up this on this movie, I want to ask a plot-related question. Yeah. Um, that has, when they're traveling and they are running into the um, well, there's the bartender and then there's the the guy who is like the customs guy or whatever. The behavior of these people was just so bizarre to me. Like the bizarre, the the bartender protecting Dracula and then and then the the customs guy coughing like like he has tuber- tuberculosis. Did anyone else think that that was for sure going to be? Some kind of thing that Van Helsing was going to be able to go. Well, I can help you with this if you'll do X, Y, or Z, and like I'm going to help you with this cough, or maybe he was going to turn up dead, or maybe something. Nothing happened with the cough. I was like, why does this guy have a cough the whole time? I think it's and why is the bartender scenery chewing? I think huh? Huh? scenery chewing. I think I'm part of that actor. He wanted to be a little bit more stand out oh, in the part. <laughs> well, it worked. I was like, and Terrence, what Terrence Fisher. Really, yeah. I mean, it, it's it's so weird, you know, what some of these period pictures are like from this period, where you've got all of these, uh, you know, all these minor characters that are basically there for laughs. Mm-hmm. And what you're asking for would have been some more 
plot business, which I think would have been totally welcome. You know, if you think this movie clocks in, and I'm, I am maybe misremembering, but I think it was like 82 minutes long. Yeah. And if you think, right. if this were a Hollywood picture, let's say we took this script, what would have to be added to it would be, you know, uh, at least a couple of, like, backgrounders on Van Helsing, where he would explain well, in some yeah, different Yeah, and, you know. and further, like, most movies now, I mean, unless it's the specific trick of the movie not to do this, most movies now don't ever put anything in that's not relevant to the plot. Like, it's not important to the plot. So if someone right. coughs, like, we always joke, you know, oh, that person has tuberculosis. No matter what movie it is, if it's somebody, if it's something from before the time when they could cure, or, you know, like, uh, the, before the uh, the um, uh, vaccination or whatever, or before they can right. cure tuberculosis, everyone had tuberculosis. And so the second somebody coughs, they're going to die. And so I was like, well, surely this guy is going to die or – or it's going to be relevant to the fact that Van Helsing can help him if whatever, because he's a doctor. But I mean, so it's just the fact that it's a red herring. And I think you're right, probably that it was just the, the, the actor himself that decided to do it. It's just business. But, um, but yeah. I think it just threw me off so much because I was like, what? That's not going to be a thing. You know, why is that not well, that, a thing? That sort of character is kind of a holdover from the James Wells, yes. James Well Universal horror films where he had all these Cockney background characters, even in, <laughs> even if it was supposed to be in wherever the heck the Frankenstein movies was supposed to be. Yeah, and uh, you know they were always these sort of goofy, cockney accented side characters. And that's what Terrence I'm saying. Fisher, this is, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Terrence Fisher, you know, obviously, you know, while having a lot of his own style, obviously owed a lot to to Whale in that respect. Mm-hmm. I mean, these things are in you know no time at all. They're the they're. they're Basically, you've got Cockney guys, and you've got the Burgermeister, which is like a German concept of a mayor, and and you've you've got all kinds of crazy, uh, you know, nobility with all kinds of crazy titles, and I love it. I mean, I love the fact that this is it. It's almost like somebody was creating a massively multiplayer online game of vampires and just threw a whole bunch of. European concepts together. In- well, it's, it's Transylvania as Middle Earth. Yes, yeah. basically. <laughs> That's well, and and can I just point out how wild it is that um, true to every Hammer Hammer movie after this, in a sense, everybody is rock stupid. The guy who runs the inn is one of the smartest. The one covering for Dracula. That's because he's afraid, and and he, that makes sense. But the fact that okay, Dracula's castle. All right. Dracula's castle is a carriage ride from Karlstadt where everybody lives and you have to and you do have to go through this tall place where you record where you're going it's the quote unquote the frontier so whatever it's basically one city state over but it's a carriage ride it's apparently like 4 or 5 hours away those guys have never heard of this guy they don't know there's a Dracula they don't know there's a big castle over there i mean i guess that's kind of okay because i live in dallas and i might not know of some big ass castle in austin maybe but it is it is odd that they're so they're so close this world is so small and yet nobody nobody knows nobody knows anything about it like if you said to me i'm going to go see richard garriott i would go really richard garriott he's in austin oh beware of that guy you know but uh but yeah, with Dracula. I, I was wondering, like, I see, I didn't see it as protecting Dracula so much as he's like the same kind of villager. He's like, we don't want any trouble. Right, right, right. right. Like, That's true. And I, what I also like though is, is the letter gets delivered because Harker was just a gentleman. He was a cool guy. So hmm. travelers beware. Be cool all the time. Right. And you know, <laughs> don't be a jerk when you're traveling. Let right. your letter to your buddy who's also a vampire hunter not be delivered. Yes, so, you yes, know, yes. Be charming and be great, grateful and uh, always be nice. Or yeah. else you, could, awesome. you, you might not get saved. <laughs> so, but, and, but purely on that, he was such a gentleman, so I sent it anyway. My dad told me to burn it. Yes. Because they're basically like, look, we don't want any trouble around here. You're calling I, I, trouble. Somebody made this, this comment I was reading earlier in this book called, uh, I think this, I'm trying to figure out if this was in, yeah, it was in The Thing of Unspeakable Horror, which is a, a book about and, Hammer movies by Sinclair McKay. And can we and, just make a note real quick about uh, the, to mention how many how many Hammer, Hammer horror books did you consult today, specifically today, on Hammer horror? Today yes. I, ins- I, I consulted uh, Hammer House of Horror, Behind the Screens by Howard Maxford, Hammer Films, an exhaustive, an exhaustive filmography by Tom Johnson and Deborah Del Vecchio, Nightwalkers, Gothic Horror Movies, The Modern Era by Bruce Wright, 
A History of Horror is the Rise and Fall of the House of Hammer by a Dennis Michael, and A Thing of Unspeakable Horror, the History of Hammer Films is by it, a Sinclair. These are the books that he consulted today from his library, but this is only a small fraction of the vampire movie book. I did not, I did not <laughs> like, actually consult any... Any just any general vampire movie books or any movies any books about vampires in general, <laughs> and only consulted books about Hammer movies. For and what this good reader is Jason is why, Anderson, the real life Van Helsing. <laughs> yeah, this is this is why this is the man who writes Sword of Dracula and Alex Van Helsing. <laughs> so lest we forget. Uh, and let me ask you about a vampire question, then you can get back to what you were going to say about this thing. Um, is that thing about where you can hold two candlesticks uh, in a cross? Is that cat work ever in any other like uh, vampire lore? I mean, can you just make crosses out of anything and it works? Cause yeah, rule of cool. Uh, anything cool that you know is is, is okay. That, that's that's. Oh, well, it's a, it's a, um, a windmill at one point, right? Absolutely. That's yeah. Not, how can you even be yeah. around like windows with window panes? Maybe they don't have window panes back then. I oh, think it's that a Peter Cushing. It's, it's not a cross yeah. until you're like this window pane is now a cross. Yes, <laughs> and then it's a cross. Right? That's, that's right, Tony. It's the belief. And I, I think it, I think you're exactly right. I think that if if Peter Cushing, maybe not me, maybe not you, but if Peter Cushing walked up to you know was facing Dracula and then said, "I touched the cross in this window and I use its power on you," I believe it would work. I actually, and you have to have faith, according to the Fright Night universe. You have to have faith. <laughs> yes, I think that's I think that's for real. You know, at least in the in in this universe and. Boy, I mean, yeah, in Brides of Dracula, that is so cool. Was it Drew oh, yeah. pointed out, or was it was it Tony that that's uh, geez when he jumps up? I don't even want to spoil that. Let's save that one. But boy, that's amazing. What oh he yeah, does, that's yeah, a great cross. That's a great moment. But yeah, that's not that's not just with these movies. Uh, in uh, Toby Hooper's uh, Salem's Lot, if I recall, they make a cross out of a couple of popsicle sticks. Uh, I love I love when he's walking through and he throws the that's cross. A craft. You know, they cr- throw the cross into the into the coffin like it's like a grenade in like Gears of War or something. You know, like <laughs> ruining that. You know. Also, that he and seems he's... to have an endless supply of crosses. I mean, he he like <laughs> he's wanting just kind of throwing stuff around and just ruining bits. Like I would, and he tells the little normal. girl. He, he tells the little girl, "Here, put on this pretty thing." And I'm like, "Why has she never heard of cross before?" Well, you know, <laughs> I guess not. Well, you know, yeah, it is interesting that these British people, uh, in this character, you know, who are it's theoretically Anglicans, but I guess they're not religious because none of them really know what to make of the cross, other than <laughs> Peter Cushing. They're all like, are you sure you want me to wear this thing? Well, and even Mina, when they put the cross in her hand, she doesn't actually drop it. She just passes out. <laughs> and it's oh, like, a, I think you would drop moment. it if it hurt your hand. Like, that's yeah. just a great moment, too, where it's like this litmus test. Like, hey, Harold, this, I don't really want to. No, go ahead. And then, <laughs> and they're like, oh, man, she's totally a vampire. It's like John Carpenter's the thing. <laughs> Here, yeah. Let me touch you with it. That's oh. it's so good. Like, yeah. it's just. It's just so cool. You gotta get the impression that at one point in time he's probably visited some vampire house where the vampires come home and there's just like holy water everywhere and there's crosses everywhere and they're like, Dead gum it, Van Helsing's <laughs> been here. He just ruined everything. We can't keep nice things with Van Helsing around and just <laughs> their whole house is just full of stuff they can't touch. And just how maddening. And then he stakes them because he jumps out of the, cause he, you know. This guy and he jumps out of the shadows. Ha ha! You know? I love that. But before oh, they get insane. home, they're just like, oh, everywhere with the holy water and the crosses and the garlic. Oh, so annoying. Wow. Okay, let me <laughs> let me tell you. Let me tell you. We've gone on probably at least an hour, maybe more. I don't know. I think we got started a little bit late, but good, great. I don't know. This is such an amazing uh, movie to discuss. Let's see. What else do we want to touch on, and then we need to like give people their their final. Um, you know, I don't even want to. We had, I'd put on the agenda. Let's talk about differences with the novel and other versions. But I think we've touched on that. And besides, who cares at this point? I mean, I, I'm a huge fan of the of the novel, but this um, you don't watch this movie in hopes that that they're going to to be. Well, the closed. things I my closing remarks would be the things I took away. Like I really. We haven't talked about it. I really love how in horror, Hammer Horror, how just the blood is like the brightest thing you can possibly get. Yes. Oh yeah. It's mm-hmm. a, I mean, it's very. Of. Uh, I mean, other other movies have something similar, but there's a there's a certain Hammer Horror blood that just is awesome. Um, well, the closest, of the, the clo- go ahead. The closest equivalent would maybe be like a Herschel Gordon Lewis right. movie, or maybe like a George yeah. Romero movie from the seventies. It's just yes. it looks like guap. Yeah. 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 
it's frothy. It, it kind of it kind of foams and froths. Uh, yeah, they had it specially made. Uh, I can only imagine that they deliberately chose to have it not look like blood. You know, because blood looks like blood. You know, if you if you see blood like on asphalt or something like that, it's always that that sort of bright, really sort of you know what blood looks like. As, as, right. as, this this stuff does not look like blood. It looks like yeah, it looks like some weird Kool-Aid kind of thing. When all the when all the women get turned into vampires, they're always like have now bright super bright red lipstick. Oh yeah. And they're like much more provocative, like everything is like amped up. And then but uh, apparently they, yeah. apparently they fall asleep before getting a chance to like wa- brush their teeth or wash their face cuz like Lucy falls asleep in her in her coffin with her um blood all coming out of her mouth. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Not, not Lucy. I'm sorry, not Lucy. No, it was the it was the um the first vampire from the uh, the original yes. that he got, I think yeah, it was her. Let's see yeah. It's such a good time. It's like the equivalent of like stumbling home drunk. It's very interesting mm-hmm. in watching these movies like in 58, you know, they're even as they become more sexually licentious, you know, as Mina starts to sort of come into her own, all it means is that her nightgown gets slightly looser. When you get down to like lust for a vampire, which by the way, I think is a fine film in a sense. It's the the, the blood there's it, it it's like night and day. You still have all that hammer business, but first of all, there's like blood all over the gowns, and the and the blood over the gowns gives you a better look at at the at the actresses themselves, and and it's you know the the use of it all it all changes. It all gets a lot more graphic basically as as time goes on. This is all still I don't know what would be the word. It's still pretty staid. You know, by modern, I love any, any modern sense. All the melty Dracula stuff at the end too. Oh my gosh! In that just awesome like Dracula signet ring on like a floor with zodiac and occult symbols. Yes, <laughs> like it's so. Well, like, you're like, oh man, who has you know who has that floor except Dracula? Yeah, he's the only one. And then he you know he melts Definitely. away and he leaves that, and you're like, whoa! And every everything in that scene is. Of Dracula now, you know. Yeah. The, the devil worship aspect of vampire lore is really amped up in the yeah. movies. Yes. Yeah. You know, they turn that up to, to twenty. They yeah, it wasn't like, there at all in the um in the in in the uh, Universal ones, and it's not there in the later ones because later vampire movies. I'm not talking about Hammer, but later vampire movies get rid of the notion entirely that these guys are evil. What's what I love about Hammer vampire movies is that. They are evil, they are exciting, they are seductive, they are attractive. The fact that they are attractive is a problem. That makes it interesting. You know, in other words, it's evil and it's attractive and that's worth talking about. Whereas if something well, is... Well, yeah. Go ahead. Fisher, you know, had this, has this phrase and you see this in a lot of his other horror films is, is the charm of evil and it's... Yes. You know, his Dracula, you know, he starts out very genteel and just turns into this sort of berserk monster. And, you know, even his version of Mr. Hyde, he, he did a, you know, you're used to, when you think of Mr. Hyde, you think of this very, like, ape-like, you know, yeah. thug. And the the hammer uh, the, from Two Faces of uh, Dr. Jekyll, the, the Mr. Hyde is actually better looking than Dr. Jekyll. That's right. That's absolutely right. He's a seducer. So they're really into this theme. And I think, you know, in our more modern, I don't know, uh, rel- kind of relativist age, we've lost this notion of, of the seduction of evil, you know, which is sad because there's a lot of excitement there. There's a lot of excitement in sort of the the naughtiness. Um, so, you know, I, I I don't know. I mean, I, I guess I could say as we've become more psychologically healthy, we've lost some of the cool eroticism of horror. Well, it's also the, you know, sympathy for the devil kind of aspect to it where, you know, maybe yeah. he was just misunderstood. There's a lot mm-hmm. less of, you know, wow, the devil's not a cool dude. Right. He's not somebody you want to be mixed up in. <laughs> Yeah. Right, I mean, you know, it, that that actually reminds me a lot of Bundy. You know, of course, this is pre-Bundy, but Ted Bundy was as good-looking as Mark Harmon, who actually played him in a movie, you know, and, and he was totally able to just walk in and talk to people and chat with them and then kill them. And that was to that me, was that's, what it was about. that's where the true true evil lies, right. is someone who's so good. And that, and that's what, you know, throughout time has kind of been the whole thing. It's not uh, some dude with horns and, you know, beastly looking right. to, to people. He's the, like, he's he is the, it is the seducer. It is, you know, these vampires are a metaphor for that even, you know, yeah. in addition to, you know, multitudes of other things. But, like, you know, he's somebody, hey, I'm really charming. And then, oh, no, you know, that's, this is really... 
until at the last we minute bad, you know? he's gonna. He did sort of see, gonna kill you. We did sort of see a modern day version of that in the new Friday Night, though. Yeah, we'll agree. Yes, absolutely, absolutely correct. When the creep That's turns absolutely. on, the creep the creep factor is high. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, so very cool. Um, all right, we should do we should do final thoughts and uh, and um, any endorsements that you want to do. Uh, so Julia. Final thoughts, Horror of Dracula. Well, you know, I was dreading it, but it was not so bad. Uh, I can't thanks believe you were dreading it. <laughs> <laughs> thanks to Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing for just being awesome and, and the awesome furniture that I want for my my uh, giant mansion castle that I'm, I'll have at some point that I'll decide to decorate with antiques, even though currently I, I don't. Well, it sounds like, like win win because of course, <laughs> you know, if Alex Van Helsing takes off, I'm sure Jason will construct a castle. And if you there want you all the hammer furniture, you both win in this. In this, because I'm sure you wouldn't refuse. Like, oh man, my wife just wants to furnish her house with hammer stuff. Boo hoo! You you won't get much resistance there. So yeah, it was it was it was it was okay. It was enjoyable. Outstanding. Um, all right, uh, Drew. Final thoughts, Dracula. Uh, this is one of those movies. If you claim to be a horror fan and you have not seen this then you are a poser. (laughs) (laughs) Or it's time. (laughs) Drew tells it like it is. Remedy that now, right now. Go to Amazon. You can can rent it off of Amazon right now. For me, I could throw it to my Roku box, and that was awesome. And, in fact, they have a thing where if you buy the DVD, you can, if I'm not mistaken, you can watch it immediately or something (laughs) crazy like that because Amazon has this crazy deal with certain DVDs. You can watch it instantly when you buy the DVD. Which is as opposed to those DVDs that you buy that you're not allowed to watch. No, well you can watch it instantly. <laughs> I know what you meant. It just sounded like you were saying you go and buy the DVD and then you can actually play it right. <laughs> yeah, well you can do that too if you didn't have to ship to you. But uh, you know, it, actually, I cannot figure out. We were talking about this. Why there's no Netflix app for the Wii? I mean, the, well, there's Netflix. I'm sorry. Why there's no Amazon Video on Demand app for the Wii? Uh, well, it's all about. There's yeah, eventually there multiple. there undoubtedly there will be one eventually. Um, because I can watch my Netflix on the Wii right away, but uh, with Amazon Video On Demand, i got to either have a Roku box, which I don't have, or I can watch it on the PC. Drew, uh, let's see, Drew, we talked. Tony, did we? Did I get your final thoughts on Dragon? Oh, I, I had not seen it in a while, and I just remembered how awesome it is. And and just, just random things like, wow, you know, midway through, they kill Harker. <laughs> like, he yes. turns into a vampire, they kill him, you just... You're just like, oh man, I'd forgotten about that. That's that's a departure, and that's actually pretty cool. And what a thing to have happen, you know, your buddy in assassination. Well, I gotta do this, you know. Yeah. That kind of stuff. But I, it was, yeah. I need to watch this more often, actually. So. Yeah, and we never, you know, it's funny. We never get any of that business either. If uh, if if Van Helsing feels pain, he does not. You know, I don't agree with that. that. I think he looks very pained when he sees uh, Harker in the in the coffin. Yeah. He looks very pained. He definitely like, really looks he's, pained when, when Dracula was strangu- strangling him. Well, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but also, I mean, he does not, I mean, doesn't, this is not work he takes takes lightly. I mean, no. when you say he doesn't feel like, I mean, he definitely, the reactions, especially when he's killing everyone, and you hear screams, and he's doing this, you could yeah. tell he's like, well, no, it I, has to be done. So mm-hmm. he reminds me, in a way, it, it's going to sound. So, I think these two have never been compared to one another. But Peter Cushing, at least in these movies, reminds me a lot of Clint Eastwood in the, in mm-hmm. terms of that just true stoicism. It's like, mm-hmm. right, you know, bad shit happens in this universe. Innocent people die. All kinds of things happen. I do the best I can. Now I'm going to go and do some grisly work, and I'm going to grit my teeth. You know, and yeah. And, uh, and it's so, um, and this, you know, my final thought, boy, Peter Cushing, especially if you're like a Star Wars fan or anything like that, and you've never seen these, it'll blow your mind to see Peter Cushing in this role. Uh, because having seen him in Star Wars, you can kind of imagine him as Frankenstein, as Dr. Frankenstein, that kind of makes sense. But him as a hero and what a unique creature he is as a hero, I mean, how totally unlike anybody else. He is. That's just uh, astonishing. I, I I love this movie. It's um, I, it's impossible to say anything new about it, and yet we've just sort of gabbed on like geeks for like nearly 90 minutes, and, and I'm so excited about it. Um, I, I can't say anything else other than watch this and then go watch Brides of Dracula right after it. Uh, and let's see, endorsements. Um, don't forget to read uh, the ongoing ongoing series Halloween Man uh, from, from Drew because that rocks. 
well, thank you. Yeah, yeah. What else do I have uh, going on this week? Um, I was just rereading Nightwalkers by Bruce Wright, and I just really love it. It's a, it's such a wonderful book, and I think it's out of print. But uh, you know, I got mine on on Amazon. You, nothing's really truly out of print anymore. Cause you can always find a copy on Amazon. You just gotta hope nobody's gouging. Right. That's a, that's absolutely right. With stuff that's true, you know. But Bruce Wright wrote these two books where he would go through basically, you know, just each book gets, I mean, each movie gets like a page and a half long essay, and it's really outstanding. It does one on science fiction um, called Yesterday's Tomorrow's and one on horror movies called Nightwalkers, and they're just great. So that's me. Anybody else have uh, endorsements? No, nope, just uh, I, I do. Okay, go. I wanted to endorse uh, a book that's hard to get here in the States, although you probably would be able to get it off of Amazon. I mentioned it's called Terrence Fisher, who directed Horror Dracula, among many other Hammer Horror films, and he is my one of my absolute favorite horror movie directors. Uh, it's called Terrence Fisher, Horror, Myth, and Religion. It was written huh. by Paul Leggett, who is a Presbyterian minister, and it's a wonderful book. It's it's kind of a mix between being a biography and a uh, religious essay while looking at, at gothic <coughs> horror and sort of the, the religious overtones in those. And it's just it's a really interesting read, whether or not you're a Hammer fan or not. I think uh, um, pretty much anybody could take something from it. Uh, and Very if, cool. uh, you know, you're religiously inclined at all, you can, it adds, uh, adds another layer of interest there. I'll yeah, totally post a link on the Facebook page. Those yeah, yeah, yeah. Can... Well, we now have the blog as well, CastleDragonPodcast.com. So and Jason, those... just said, Jason just said, OK Go, and it reminded me to endorse OK Go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> There's this video on, on that's going around Facebook of OK Go and the Muppets, which is just about the awesomest thing uh, ever. So, yeah, so I'm, Darren, Darren and, I'm the curmudgeon because I didn't really like anything off that album, and I feel kind of sad that I didn't. No, but but the, but the video is just so hilarious with the Muppets. So so Google OK Go and the Muppets, and you'll have fun. Well, Darren in the audience points out that Don't Be Afraid of the Dark from Guillermo del Toro. I, I'm not sure if this is out yet or just coming out. August 26th, so it's just out. And uh, this is a remake of a 1973 film starring Kim Darby, who is uh, the girl from True Grit. And apparently it's awesome So and, and terrifying. And I've seen trailers for it, and it, look, it looks really good. Yeah, they just had a screening that I wasn't able to go to. I haven't been able to go to a lot of the stuff, including the Shock Hop, which I was really sad about. Um, it, was a, it, it, went, it went great. Uh, I was so you know, huge unhappy turnout. that... that I wasn't able to go, and I apologize. But there's been a bunch of stuff like that, and I heard when after the screening, I heard really great things about Don't Be Afraid of the Dark. So I'm pretty psyched. Yeah, I I, I can't wait to see that. I'm also looking forward to The Woman in Black. Um, mm, the trailer that for that looked pretty good. And uh, also uh, Simply Scripts, where our friend uh, Darren and and uh, and all the guys over at, at Simply Scripts come from. Any script you're looking for, you can go to simplyscripts.com, and that's a truly an awesome site. So and. Uh, that is all we have. Be, come, uh, be sure and come to CastleDraculaPodcast.com, and we will post soon what movie we got going on next week. I think uh, I think it's a zombie movie, but uh, we'll talk in Woo! And uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm excited. I know Julia is going to be super excited. <laughs> I think it's I think it's Return of the Living Dead, and I know Julia, you are going to love love Return of the Living Dead. Yeah, we're going to start talking about what the payback is going to be on all these. <laughs> what it is I'm going to make you watch for having to watch all these. Quite a prejudice, right, Julia? <laughs> I did. I made him go watch The Help, so that was that was one. I see so much <laughs> Dirty Dancing in your future. Yes. <laughs> the problem I just is... posted about Dirty Dancing today that that every time that because of Dirty Dancing, every time I carry a watermelon, I always think in my head I carried a watermelon. I carried a what? <laughs> but the thing, the, the sad. I'm such an all-around movie geek that I actually enjoy that stuff. I like The Help. I like Dirty Dancing. I like Flashdance. So I've got to come up with another form of torture then. All right, I'll hey, work on it. Stay alive. We'll go dancing. Staying alive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, staying alive, absolutely. What is what is that? Uh, that Satan's Alley, I think, is the name of the Broadway show that's oh, yeah. staying alive. Yeah. Oh, yes. That had the best rock song theme of, of <laughs> any movie ever. That was, uh, what is that, Running Over, I think, uh, by Frank yeah. Stallone? Yeah. Which uh, also, Staying Alive, has a Choose Your Own Adventure book. That's right. I think you got that for me. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I borrowed it back from you. Oh, awesome. darn it. Because my daughter's really getting into Choose Your Own Adventure books, and I know that would mean a lot to her. Well, <laughs> well But no guilt well, or anything. Is that another endorsement? Choose Your Own Adventure? <laughs> yes. 
Yes. Um, okay. Anyway, uh, that's it. We should we should close it out now that we've thoroughly driven away anybody who might be interested. <laughs> so, all right. Come back next week. Castle Dracula Podcast. We're really enjoying this. Leave questions for us on CastleDraculaPodcast dot com or the Facebook page. Thank you very much, guys, and I will talk to you soon. Later. Bye. A routine is a good thing to have. And sometimes, a routine is a good thing to break. Take a break with McDonald's one two three dollars menu. Get a tasty sausage McMuffin for a dollar. And add any size coffee or soft drink like Dr. Pepper for a dollar more. Because if you don't deserve a morning that's a little easier and a lot tastier, who does? Price and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with combo meal. Wow, how things can change from one week to the next. Hey, hope everybody out there is staying healthy. I know everything is super crazy. We feel disoriented by the COVID-19 virus. It's more important than ever to stay connected and check in with your loved ones. That's why I'm so happy I've got T-Mobile. Listen, T-Mobile isn't just talking the talk. They're taking measures right now to make life easier for everyone by doing the right thing for their customers during this really critical time. For example, T-Mobile has ensured all current customers with data plans have access to unlimited smartphone data on their network for two months. We're all in this together. T-Mobile truly believes that. And while many T-Mobile stores are temporarily closed to help keep customers and employees healthy, they've still got you covered with any help you need. Just check out T-Mobile.com. You can see what stores are still open and how you can manage your account online. Stay safe out there. During congestion, customers using more than 50 gigs a month may notice reduced speeds prioritization. Video typically at 480p, capable device required.